just left, but we'll start anyway. Um, so the uh, first item, we're going to be joined in a few minutes by the Health and Welfare Committee, Senate Health and Welfare at 10 o'clock. They're due to come in. Um, and uh, I got the wrong agenda here. So I better look at the right agenda. Uh, I got it. Thank you, Joe. Um, so uh, what I thought would be helpful is if um, Eric was to go over the veto bill with us. So my plan is at 11.30 to get back together in room one and talk about next steps, if that's all right. And then we're going to hear at 10 a.m. with the, uh, from the uh, Harvard regarding the research on done waiting periods. So if Eric, if you would go over, many of us may not remember completely the bill that we, that the governor vetoed last uh, June, uh, or May. Yeah, I think, I think it was. was it might have been June, 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 June 10th, yeah. Um, if you'd go over the veto message as well as what was in the bill that was vetoed, um, and so we can understand what parts he didn't like and what parts he liked why he vetoed the bill. Sure, sounds good. Morning, everybody. Morning. Eric, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Council. As uh, Senator Sears was indicating, here to talk about S-169 as well as the governor's <coughs> veto of S-169 last year. I had to do the same thing. I had to refresh my own recollections to all the pieces that were in S-169 because there were several. It wasn't just one, one particular uh, firearms-related piece of legislation. There was a number of different things, and that gives rise to the title of the bill, which was an activated firearms procedures. There were several different pieces of it. And, and actually, several of them were related to firearms legislation that you had passed the year before. I mean, you had passed a couple of quite large, lengthy bills. There was Act 94 that had a number of different firearms procedures. There was the extreme risk protection order legislation that had also been passed the year before. And some of what was going on in S-169 was some, some, I won't call it cleanup, but certainly some amendments, some uh, clarification of some of the procedures that you had already passed the year before. So, has everybody actually had a copy of S-169? Yep. Has it passed both bodies? And a copy of the veto letter as well? I don't have the veto. Yeah, they're in the folders. It's it's in it is? Yep. It's in, uh, okay. there. Should we run away down, Gary? Nope. Mm -hmm. It's just a one-pager. Looks like that. Oh, it's... Might seem to be on the last page. Oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. All set. So yeah, let's. Absolutely. So yeah, okay, great. So let's let's look at the bill itself first, just to refresh all of our recollections of what the different pieces of it were. Uh, first section dealt with the ban on large capacity ammunition feeding devices, the high capacity magazine ban. Remember, it had been in Act 94 the previous year, and the general approach of the magazine ban was. Uh, if it's a, a long gun, any magazine that had a capacity of greater than 10 rounds, and if it was a handgun, a magazine with a capacity of greater than 15 rounds, was generally prohibited, right? The criminal penalty associated with it, they were banned. But there was a number of exceptions, a fairly lengthy list of exceptions. And what you did uh, last year, what the legislature did anyway, in S-169, was to uh, do some amending around some of those exemptions that had already been in. So you remember one of the exceptions, had to do with um, shooting competitions. Everybody remember that one? There had been an exemption for uh, high capacity image feeding devices brought into the state of Vermont. They had to be brought into the state. It wasn't ones that were possessed by Vermont residents. They had to be brought into Vermont for purposes of use in a shooting competition. You made a couple of amendments, but that had a sunset. Everybody remember that? That sunset last year, July 1st, 2019. So, a couple of different changes were made in S-169 to that piece of the magazine. One was that the sunset was repeated. So, that actually isn't in section one. It happens to be at the end of the bill in section six. That's a repeal of the sunset uh, on that exemption so that though they could be brought into the state for these competitions going forward uh, without any time. Everybody remember that piece? So, another uh, change that was made to that exemption, which is right on uh, the underlying language on page one, uh, in subsection C1A, 
had to do with the fact that originally that exemption only applied for uh, people bringing the uh, high capacity devices in from out of state. Vermont residents didn't have the benefit of the same exemption. I don't, if they were going to use it at a shooting competition, it was only folks from out of state uh, who were able to do so. So what this proposal was in S-169 was it made that also apply to Vermont residents. So if you, if you possessed it, if you were grandfathered in by having possessed the uh, magazine before the effective date of Act 94, well, uh, Vermont residents as well as out-of-state residents could use them at these competitions. So that's that piece of it. Um, if you move on uh, down to page two, another exemption that had existed for the magazine law, the magazine prohibition, was for uh, law enforcement use. So legitimate law enforcement purposes by law enforcement officers, but they were applied to Vermont officers only. The, the question that, that come up is what that does happen sometimes, that an out-of-state officer might either pursue a suspect into the state of Vermont or otherwise be coordinating their law enforcement work with a, a Vermont law enforcement officer. And the idea of this uh, exemption, or at least the proposal in S-169, was to expand that exemption so it applied not only for Vermont law enforcement officers, but out-of-state law enforcement officers too, who were in Vermont uh, for legitimate law enforcement purposes. That's the second piece. Um, the, uh, Actually, that's as far as the magazine goes. The uh, the uh, it's only a sort of minor language piece. Of the uh, you'll see the subsection F on page two. It's just a, a language change. It was proposed that, right. that rather than saying establish shooting competition, it's organized shooting competition. Right. I think it was just a, a minor change that you thought that was more accurately described uh, competitions themselves. So that uh, covers the magazine piece. Now, another amendment to what you have passed in Act 94, which was done uh, in this bill, had to do with background checks. Right. Now, the background check piece was also a big part of that. So-called Bennington. Yes. That, if I remember that correctly, that's on the top of page three, exactly. That was the issue. Remember, there's those there were background checks generally required for private sales of firearms. Federal law requires background checks for sales by firearms dealers. What you passed required it for private transactions, uh, not, a, not between dealers. But there's a list of exemptions. There are times when you don't have to get a background check when you sell a firearm. One of these times was for an immediate family member. But you see the proposal from S-169, top of page three, is to expand that list of who is an immediate family member. So a transfer between siblings-in-law, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, also would not be required to get a background check. It's another amendment to what you've done in 194. <coughs> All right, so now we move on to now the next piece is substantively new. This is not a change to what you had already passed the previous year. This is the, the waiting period. And if you see what passed the legislature was a waiting period of 24 hours that applied to handguns only. So generally speaking, you can't transfer a handgun uh, to another person until 24 hours after the completion of the background check that's required by either federal or state law. Now remember, uh, the federal and state law background checks uh, depend, vary depending on who's making the sale. Federal sales by a licensed firearm dealer, the background check for Vermont is a private sale under certain circumstances. So any one of those sales uh, has to go, undergo a background check that's done through the National Instant Criminal Background Check System run by the Department of Justice. So uh, once that background check is complete, the 24-hour clock begins. And that's a 24-hour waiting period that is established. You see the way it's phrased is, 24 hours after the completion of the background. Now again, that also, uh, as we just said, not all sales require background checks. So for example, when you look at subsection C there, the section doesn't apply to a handgun transfer that does not require the background check. So if it's a transfer between an immediate family member, law enforcement agency, an emergency situation, any, any transfer that doesn't require a temporary loan, for example, any, any transfer that doesn't require the background check in the first place, is not going to be subject to the waiting period. You don't have to wait the 24 hours. Let's see how that would work. Um, so that was the language that, uh, that passed both bodies uh, in S-169. 
Next piece, uh, section four, relates to the extreme risk prevention order. Remember that also um, had passed the previous year. The legislature established those. Now, what had come up in this situation was that, remember, an ERPO can be filed for by a law enforcement officer, or sorry, by the, a state's attorney or the attorney general. They can you know, use information that they get from law enforcement officers, but the, the LEO, him and herself, can't file it directly. What had come up was some physicians were concerned that they might obtain and were coming to uh, awareness about information about a person who was dangerous, but they felt that they couldn't disclose that information to a law enforcement officer or to the state's attorney without violating HIPAA, the Federal Health Privacy Act. So what this language does is it essentially uh, piggybacks onto an existing HIPAA exemption. But HIPAA already has an exemption for, for situations in which there's a reasonable basis for thinking that there's a harm that's going to come to someone. It allows information to be disclosed during those situations. So this uh, essentially uh, works that same exemption from HIPAA into the ERPO law so that uh, emergency room doctors, physicians, healthcare providers would be able to disclose that information in an emergency situation directly to a law enforcement officer who could then pass it along to the state's attorney if they want to file for ERPO. Does that include uh Mental health specialist. Yes. Healthcare provider um, does. That definition you can see there. No, no, there. Somebody asked. No. Can I go back to something? Yeah. Just on the previous page where it says background check is completed. Pardon me, sorry. On section three of the previous page, yeah. where it says after the completion of the background check. Give me my yeah. I'm Bio assuming that, that means after the results, results get tested and been reserved, yeah. returned to the dealer or the seller. Either. It doesn't mean after you've completed the form with the seller. So correct. 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 I, think so. I think the reading of it is that it is after the uh, NIST right. system sends it. you the results. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Next is the report. Yes, sir, we had some reporting about her post. But that was, that was the request of Dr. Brassardi Bennington, who there's a national effort to um, try to, by emergency room docs, to try to keep track of the red flag laws that have developed around the country. That's right. To try to, and so they were looking for reports from all the states that have this essential law to try to compile the effect or the lack thereof. Yeah. Yeah, so that's exactly that, to try and um, Thank you. provide them with that sort of data and information uh, so they could see how their folks were working in practice and whether they were getting the information that they needed in dangerous situations. Uh, section 6, I already mentioned, that's the repeal of the, uh, the sunset, uh, rather, of the contest. Exactly, the shooting contest. So that's a review of what was in S-169. Uh, that was passed by both bodies last year, and then it was vetoed by the governor on June 10th. Um, if anyone has a copy of the veto letter in front of them now, you'll see that it's, it's relatively short. And the, the essence of the rationale for the veto, I think, is in the second to last, last paragraph. But a quick review of what's in the language before that is sort of an introductory paragraph mentioning that the veto was happening, a review of what was done the previous year, which I just spoke about. The veto letter reviews the same thing. <coughs> During the past year, background checks were passed, the ERPOs were passed, uh, ability of law enforcement to remove firearms from those accused of domestic violence, increase, uh, establishing of an age limit, uh, so that firearms have to be, a person has to be 20 years of age or older to purchase a firearm. So that's a review of, as I mentioned, what the legislature had passed the previous year. And I think the key paragraph to look at is the one following those bulleted points. See that one? It says, with these measures in place, we must now prioritize strategies that address the underlying causes of violence and suicide. I do not believe S-169 addresses these areas. So again, the paragraph afterward follows up on that. It says, moving forward, I ask the legislature to work with me to strengthen our mental health system, reduce adverse childhood experiences, combat addiction and provide every Vermonter with open economic opportunities. So I think the real operative paragraph is the one immediately preceding that one, and, and that sort of goes to the rationale of the 
to say, if you read that as um, expressing the view that the S-169 doesn't address the, the underlying causes of violence and suicide. So that's the, I think, the rationale that's there in the language. That the elements, the provisions of 169 that were passed, including the background check, don't actually uh, uh, impact violence and suicide. I think that would sort of imply that uh, it's a data issue, it's an information issue, that there is no evidence, no evidentiary connection between uh, between the provisions of 169, including a background, or sorry, a waiting period, for example, there's no evidence uh, indicating that there's a correlation between uh, a waiting period, for example, and a uh, reduction in violence or reduction in suicide. And I'm sort of extrapolating a little bit as to what's in there because it's relatively brief, but that's the way I, I read it. Yeah, I, I would just say, I'll be right back. I feel that there's a, a built-in contradiction here, which is he's, the governor is touting his signing of um, Act 94, and he's saying, among other things, that the ability of law enforcement to remove firearms from those accused of domestic violence makes our community safer from violence, and he's proud of that. But he could as easily have vetoed that and said it doesn't get at the root causes of domestic violence. Um, so in one case, he's saying removing the gun from the situation makes our community safer. In the case of S-169, he's saying removing the guns isn't what we need to do. We need to go to the root cause. Um, it seems in both cases you would want to attack the root cause and potentially remove the gun from the situation. So I don't I don't know if this letter doesn't strike me as um, overly helpful uh, in anything but understanding what his uh, what his um, you know it's it's not really a rationale for veto it seems to me it's more like a, a failure to provide a rationale. Yes, well. I was surprised when I read the letter here, and that's all it said, and I agree with Philip on that. Because there wasn't an objection to any particular thing in the bill itself. I mean, there were, did he object to the waiting period? Did he object to the, we don't know at all, except that it doesn't attack the root causes, which um, is true doesn't attack the root causes, but we are trying to do that in other bills. So I, I, I agree with Philip. It's a pretty, pretty weak. Other comments? I, I'm, I'm, uh, I think there were some public comments by the governor regarding the waiting period was his main objection, as I understand it. But he has, this letter doesn't provide a, a direction as to what he would support. So it makes it difficult to plan a, a bill that would be things that, you know, that the government would support. And unlike S-37, I do feel picked on this year. The two bills he made voted for me.
get their opinion as we develop that bill, whether it's a new waiting period bill or we could take this bill, rewrite it, and put in 48 hours. See if he likes that better. So I would suggest that this was probably his the opportunity to explain because that's that's what a veto letter is is explaining why I'm vetoing. I mean, we could have them come in and further explain, but the veto letter is the explanation of why I'm vetoing. Probably, I, I think that we can internally have a debate about our respective interpretations of what he was talking about. Well, I understand it doesn't give clear guidance on what specific provision uh, he is objecting to in the veto letter in total. <coughs> I understand we're going to take information here today um, that is in support of the one clause I believe the committee is thinking is the source of conflict. I think that it would be only fair if we're going to open that door up that we have the administration come and be specific. Uh, because if that is the provision that we are now taking evidence on, uh, and I would only think that the fair way of approaching it would be to provide an opportunity to present the evidence that would support what the governor's position is. Yes. Um, I, I think Joe's point makes good sense assuming we're writing a new bill if if the committee's decision is to override the existing bills then i don't think it's necessarily uh at this point that we need to be taking testimony from the administration because the veto is his he, he has made it with the veto and the and the letter um but yeah if we if if we make a determination to write a new bill then i think we would ask for all kinds of witnesses to speak to it, and the administration would be a normal route of, you know, trying to trying to figure out the direction. Does that make sense? My, my only reaction, Philip, is that we're about to take what I view to be evidence on a provision that people are assuming is the one source of contention. see the door being open for a full discussion of that. I see two folks on the schedule who I understand are going to come in and support one provision that is the source of contention. I would therefore question if we're not going to have an open discussion on both sides of it, why we are taking testimony from these two individuals now. We could have a full-fledged conversation and vote within the committee. Uh, based on what the governor's veto message says, but once you open the door to provide evidence, um, it seems to me at least uncomfortable that the door doesn't get open to both sides. I'm uh, sorry, Senator, but nobody said the door wasn't open to both sides. The, the committee is going to hear from two experts from Harvard who have studied waiting periods. It's that simple. And I don't know what we're going to say, whether it's in support of the bill or in opposition to the bill. Um, they are national. national. I've done a national thing. They're not, I don't think it's um, necessarily when we make a decision to override the bill, all I want to do is get the best information I can to help that decision. I'm perfectly happy to hear from the governor if the governor wants to come down and meet with this committee. But I'm not willing to hear from, um, you know, every person about whether or not we should attempt to override the governor's veto. If we do a new bill, I'm perfectly happy to have testimony from everyone. But if the governor's legal counsel, uh, while we're making a decision, or the governor himself wants to come to this committee, he's more than welcome. Uh, but if, if in, in terms of us making a decision whether to try to override his veto, I'm more than happy to hear from either he or his legal counsel. Um, but I'm, I don't feel like I'm taking testimony on whether on this. I think I'm taking test. I think we're taking testimony from two people who've offered to drive all the way up here from. Or maybe they flew. I don't know how they got here. Um, but people who are willing to come up here from Cambridge, Mass. Uh, to talk to 
to us about their national expertise and waiting periods. And it's not really, I don't see it the same as what you were, how you see it. So maybe I'm missing something. This is the exact process we used on S37, exact process. We heard from some people regarding the veto message, um, the people to help us understand the decision made by Judge Crawford, which had changed things. And um, the, the veto message on S37 was clearer. So I don't see the difference. That's why I didn't schedule Jay Johnson or Phil Scott. But if, if Governor Scott or, or his uh, legal counsel want to come down and talk to us, we're more than happy here. I open invitation. I happen to have a meeting with him at noontime, and perhaps if we can at least agree not to hold a vote on anything uh, prior to getting an answer to that. We will not hold a vote on whether to override until after we hear from If the governor wishes to testify, but I would like to welcome the health and welfare community to join us. And, uh, I don't know if our witnesses from Cambridge are here. Oh. 